I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today that no matter what you're going through, what you're experiencing, God has a tremendous plan for your life. And it is the desire of our Heavenly Father that we live life to the fullest. Last week, we launched a series of messages from the New Testament book of 1 Peter. It's a short book, and we'll be working our way all the way through 1 Peter in the weeks ahead. Now, I had a great opportunity this week to sit in and hear a variety of ministers share the good news of Jesus from different perspectives. One of my favorite preachers of all times, Dr. George Wood, the former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, spoke at a dinner that Pastor Anianci and I went to on Monday night to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Northern California Nevada District of the Assemblies of God. And it was awesome. It was awesome to be able to celebrate the heritage that we have as a church. And there was a lot of talk about legacy. And in the course of that conversation, I couldn't help but think about the spiritual mantle that I bear as the pastor of this church. You see, when God calls us to serve Him, He anoints and empowers us for that service. I couldn't help but think about the passing of that mantle from one to another as Elijah passed the mantle to Elisha when he ascended into heaven and I thought about Pastor Patterson and Pastor Kowalski and Pastor Forrest and Pastor Duncan and Pastor Keith, Pastor Rath, Pastor Brownell. And even before I came, Pastor Vic, who served as interim pastor here at Radiant Life Church, each one taking up that mantle for a season to bring us to the point where we are today. It's important that we recognize where we've come from so that we get a clearer perspective of how God is carrying us toward where we're going. This is living, friends, and this life isn't intended for us to live alone and On the course of life's journey, sometimes there are little markers. This week, Pastor Jack and I were chatting a lot about legacy and holiness and what these things really mean. And Pastor Jack had mentioned to me something about a conversation that he'd had with some folks in his family who have a habit of collecting mementos. And if I'm completely transparent with you, I would have to tell you, I'm one of those sentimental guys who has a hard time letting go of things. My wife could say amen to that. You know, if I touch something, I just about have a sentimental attachment with it. So today I want to share with you one of my most prized possessions. It's something I, I have not shared with very many people. I haven't shown it to very many people, but it's something I cherish with my whole heart. You see, it's I talk to you about the the mantle that I carry as the pastor of this church. I recognize that the legacy that we're living today long predates the 34-year history of Radiant Life Church. Before us, many have come, and there are many that we've never met whose life on this earth came to an end before ours began, and yet we are carrying on the legacy that they left. But there are some that we did encounter for a season, brief though it may have been. For me, one of the most influential people in my life is my grandfather, the Reverend B.F. Cockrell. Most folks have never heard of my grandfather. He wasn't a famous preacher. He pastored a small Pentecostal church in Weeniewood, Oklahoma. Yes, I said Weeniewood the booming metropolitan area of Weeniewood, Oklahoma. 
And during the Dust Bowl, the Grapes of Wrath era, my grandfather came to California to make a new life for himself and for his family. He worked in a department store to earn a living for his family and filled the pulpit in small churches throughout the Central Valley when pastors needed a break. My grandfather was not a man of great renown, but he was a man who made a great impact on my young life. I don't have very many pictures of my grandfather and I together, but one that I was able to find is a picture that was taken on Christmas of 1980 when my family hosted our family reunion and my grandparents stood on the lawn of our home in Stockton with all 20 of the grandkids. My grandparents had five children and 20 grandchildren. And I, because of birth order, was blessed to stand at one end of that line. You see, I'm the youngest of the 20 grandchildren. My grandfather's hand on my back as I stood wearing that little jersey with my birth year on the front. I don't have very many pictures of my grandfather, but in my mind, I can still hear the tone of his voice. I can still remember sitting at the dinner table when he'd pray and the food got colder and colder and colder. And I can still remember the way my grandfather dressed, even on Christmas morning at our house, he got up out of bed, buttoned up his shirt, and put on his suit jacket. That was my granddaddy, my popo. I don't remember a single day that I spent with my grandfather when he wasn't wearing a suit jacket. And when I was a teenager, after he had passed, I went through a box of things that my mother had received after his passing, and in it I found what has become one of my most prized possessions. I've taken it with me, I've kept it in my closet, and at times I have picked it up and wrapped it around myself for comfort. You see, even when we went camping, my grandfather would put on a suit jacket, and that's the suit jacket that I inherited, one of my most prized possessions. She's a beaut, isn't she? <laughs> I'm not sure if this was even popular in the late 70s when I saw him wearing it. You know, before it was considered cool to wear a blazer with jeans, my granddad was wearing a blazer with jeans. He was one of a kind. And though he surely had his faults, to me, he was an example of holiness, of righteousness, of a life that was surrendered to Almighty God, a life of commitment. Today we're going to look at an aspect of living that many are unfamiliar with that many would even reject. It doesn't sound very enticing or very cool, but I have to tell you that in our darkest hours, this aspect of life sustains us. Holy living. I want to invite you to turn in 1 Peter chapter 1, where we will begin reading today at verse 13. Would you rise to your feet for the reading of the word of the Lord today? 1 Peter 1 13 begins, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Verse 18. For you know 
that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Verse 20, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through Him, you believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and glorified Him so that your faith and hope are in God. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You for the goodness of Your grace and Your mercy. God, we thank You for the truth of Your love that speaks to our hearts today and the power of Your Word that penetrates into the darkest recesses of our beings. And Father, we thank You for the holy example that is set for us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And though we are imperfect, God, we thank You that we may reflect His likeness in this hurting and desperate world. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would live life to the fullest through holy living. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, you may be seated. Holy living means being set apart. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 14, we read, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. In the Greek, hagios, which is translated as holy in this particular passage, implies purity innocence, and being cherished. 1 Peter verse 1, or verse 16 of chapter 1 references three verses in Leviticus in which God declares His holiness and His expectation that His people will be holy. This statement appears in Leviticus 11.44 referring to remaining clean by not eating creepy crawly creatures that slither and squirm on the ground. In Leviticus 19.2, which refers to obedience to the law of the Lord and Leviticus 11.45, which declares that we are to be holy because God saves us from slavery. Leviticus 11.45 reads, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am am holy. The Hebrew word for holy is kadosh, which implies the separation and honor as something that is cleansed or set apart for a special purpose. Be holy, God says, because I am holy. If we are truly to be holy, then we have to forget fitting in. Imagine that all of our rough edges are chiseled and smoothed by the hand of God working in our lives. As such, we are like round pegs that can no longer strive to fit into the square holes of this world. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, we read, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Holiness doesn't compromise for the sake of comfort. Holy people dare to be different for the sake of shining the light of Jesus into the darkness of this world. Forget fitting in. We are to live as foreigners, as people who look and sound and act differently. Not striving to adapt to this ever-changing culture, but rather 
to remain constant and true to the one who never changes. For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our living God is eternal, therefore we must live in light of eternity. This is holiness. Holiness is Christ-likeness. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we receive a spiritual blood transfusion. No matter what our background or family of origin may be, Jesus saves us and becomes part of us because his perfect blood paid the price to set us free from our sin and adopt us into the family of God. This is a spiritual blood transfusion. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, we read, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Pause for a moment and think about it. When we think of value, when we think of worth, silver and gold come to mind. And yet... These are the very examples given of things that are perishable, that pass away. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to say to you and to me that we were not purchased with trashy things like silver and gold that belong in the dump. Because those things are not nearly as valuable, not nearly as priceless as the perfect blood of Jesus that purchased us from our sins and entered into our lives to transform us. You see, the things that this world values are insignificant and perishable. We've all heard that phrase, you can't take it with you. Doesn't matter how much bling you have. How much jewelry you amass. It doesn't matter how big your bank account is. There will come a day when you and I will breathe our last breath. And on that day, God's not going to be impressed with our bottom line. He's looking at the condition of our blood. Have we been washed with the blood of Jesus? Have we been purified through Christ? Have we been transformed. When our Heavenly Father embraces us, He picks up the scent of Jesus that we have absorbed through His presence in our lives. I can remember many of my darkest hours as a teenager. I would go into my closet and I would pull out this jacket. And even years after my grandfather entered eternity in heaven with God, I could still pick up the scent of my grandfather as if he was in the room with me in that moment, and that scent brought me comfort. There are times when I'm home on my day off, and I walk into my kid's room, and I can pick up the scent of my children. You know, my children who, today my son is 11. He has a certain scent, that boy. You know what I'm saying? My daughter is 13 years old. She has a certain scent. That young woman. And there's just something comforting there's something comforting about that scent. How many of you married couples have ever rolled over in bed and you catch your spouse's pillow and you just breathe it in only to realize they're not there anymore, but it's as if they're there because of that scent. The Word of God tells us that when our Heavenly Father embraces us, he picks up the scent of Jesus that we have absorbed through His presence in His life. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. For we are to God 
the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma that brings death. To the other, the aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Verse 17, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. I could spend hours unpacking this short passage of Scripture with you. But don't miss out on that opening statement, we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. Among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. The Bible would describe those who are being saved and those who are perishing as being in a state called sin. They are in sin. And sin stinks. But to God, we are the pleasing aroma of Christ in a world that stinks. Here at Radiant Life Church, we are committed to sharing life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We're all at different layers and different levels of aroma to God. But the most important aroma, the most pleasing aroma is that scent of Christ. Now, this passage also describes how that aroma comes across to those around us. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. One translation says we are the scent or the stench of death that brings death. Because when something good and pleasing and holy and pure and perfect confronts that which is imperfect and impure and undesirable, there's a clash in sense. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time walking into one of those candle shops. You know what I'm talking about? You walk into that candle shop, you take any candle, just about any candle, and you smell it by itself, it might smell really good. But for me, I have a sensory overload when I walk into one of those candle shops and there are all these different pleasing aromas wafting into the air at once. That's what it's like for those who refuse Almighty God. It's that overwhelming sense of things are not cohesive. But to those who are in Christ, they take the scent of Christ and they bring it into where Christ is all they inhale and suddenly they experience the power of His presence and enter into fellowship with Almighty God. Holiness is Christ-likeness. Because... In Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. The very words that come from our lips are pleasing to His ear because we speak His word. Holy and pure. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Catch that clarifier. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. Now one could misinterpret this as saying we become pure through obedience, but no, we become pure through the blood of Jesus. But how many of you know that one bath will not keep you smelling good for a lifetime? We've tried to instill in our children that one bath will not keep you smelling good for very long at all. It certainly won't make it through the week. You have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. Because you've been made pure through Christ, you begin to obey Him because you want to be holy as He is holy in a world that is unholy, in a world that stinks. And so, so you have a sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. 
You see, it's only when we tap into the heartbeat of God that we can love other imperfect people. Because when we don't tap into the heartbeat of God, then their imperfections clash with our imperfections. And what we have for one another can hardly be described as love. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6 says, And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. I love this. Those images of silver and gold, they're not good enough. But they're the best that we can think of when we think of purity. But it's not just raw silver or raw gold. It's silver purified in the crucible. That means melted down. Like gold refined seven times. That means melted down and sifted out and melted down and sifted out and melted down and sifted out seven times. We don't just read the Bible once or behave like some sort of church CEO attending on Christmas and Easter only. But we constantly immerse ourselves in the Word of God and regularly come together with our church family to invite the Holy Spirit to refine us and make us holy and pure. This requires new birth. Holy living is a choice to invite the Holy Spirit of God to hit the reset button in our lives and take us back to the innocence of infancy. We read in 1 Peter 1, 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God, friends. The language that's used here, the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to repeat language that he had been used. when he stood in the presence of Jesus. He'd heard Jesus say, born again. Maybe it didn't resonate with him. Think about it for a minute. The Holy Spirit inspires Peter to pin these words that were so confusing to a learned man named Nicodemus, a spiritual leader in his day, who came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus continued in verse 6, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Now that's the explanation that Jesus gave when Nicodemus says, What do you mean born again? And Peter was probably sitting there at night when Nicodemus came to Jesus. Peter was listening. And I don't believe Peter was the sharpest tool in the shed. You ever notice that in the New Testament of the Bible, more than any other followers of Jesus, Peter, James, and John are mentioned as being with Jesus. Jesus took them with him. There were 12 disciples but Peter, James, and John are constantly being taken somewhere with Jesus. They're alone with Jesus. And then you read some of the stuff that these guys say and do. Jesus cared for them even though they weren't the sharpest tools. Jesus pulled them aside. And so here's Peter. He's probably sitting there listening when Jesus said, you must be born again to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus goes, whoa, I'm pretty old and I'm kind of big to go back there. Ain't going to happen. Jesus said, no. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You need to be born of the Spirit and water. And he was speaking to Nicodemus about being purified and cleansed and made new. Being returned to infancy spiritually through new birth. That gives us the opportunity to curb our cravings. If we want to experience holy living, we have to curb our cravings. Jesus said, 
that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become like a little child. This means spiritual maturity actually requires us to become as innocent as babies, not acting like babies, but eating like babies. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, Therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Verse 2, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. My friend Char Blair recently said that spiritual maturity means choosing to eat the donut tomorrow. Some of you may want to write that down. Spiritual maturity means choosing to eat the donut tomorrow. Immaturity says, I'll eat the donut today and exercise tomorrow. But tomorrow seldom seems to work out the way we want when we lack self-control today. But if we exercise discipline today, and push our temptations out to tomorrow, we experience Christ-honoring, holy living now. How many times have we said, I'll eat the donut today and I'll exercise tomorrow, and then tomorrow comes, and again we say, I'll eat the donut today and I'll exercise tomorrow, and then tomorrow comes, and again we say, I'll eat the donut today and I'll exercise tomorrow. And it's this cycle that just drags on and on, and on. I think of Wimpy in the Popeye cartoons. I will gladly pay you tomorrow for a hamburger today. No, good financial planning is I will pay you today for that hamburger that I'm going to eat tomorrow. I will buy the beef, bring it home, put it in the refrigerator, and tomorrow I will cook it. So as followers of Jesus Christ, what if? What if? We curb our cravings and say, you know, I have temptation, I have cravings, I have desires, but I'm not going to put that first today. I'm going to push that out till tomorrow. Today I'm going to live holy. Today I'm going to do what Christ says to do. Today I'm going to honor God with my thoughts, with my words, with the things on my screen. You can hear the crickets chirping right now. I'm going to honor God today with the way I speak to someone who is obviously having a bad day. Tomorrow, I'll give them a piece of my mind. Tomorrow, I'll indulge that. Tomorrow, but today, I'm going to honor God. And then get up the next day, and when you're faced with the same temptation, just decide, today, I'm going to honor God. Today, I'm going to be holy. Today, I'm going to be pure. Tomorrow, maybe I'll entertain that, but today, I'm going to do it. If we lived our lives that way, then tomorrow would be a beautiful day because we wouldn't get around to the temptation. We'd be too busy with holy living. We would be glorifying God and honoring Him in all that we say and do and think. Because how many of you know that the way we think impacts our words and our actions? Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Does everybody here agree that it is good to think about things that are true, that are noble, that are right, that are pure, that are lovely, that are admirable, that are excellent and praiseworthy? That's good, right? So why put that off till tomorrow? We live in an impatient culture. I want to encourage you to let your impatience work to your advantage and today choose to think about whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy and see how that works for you. And then tomorrow you can get up and if today didn't work out well when you were thinking about what was true or noble or right or pure or lovely or admirable or excellent or praiseworthy, then go ahead and give it a shot. 
And tomorrow morning, get up and say, you know what? Today, I'm going to give that a try. Because I want, I want the goodness of God in my life. I want to be holy as he is holy. 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 16, tells us, so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Holy living means being reliant on God's love. Holy living means being intertwined with God's presence. Holy living means being confident of God's grace, and holy living means being contagious about God's Son. That word contagious can mean exciting, similar emotions or conduct in others. We are like Jesus, and He called us to go and make disciples, to help others to be like Jesus. I recently had coffee with a new friend and he was sharing with me one of the things that's kept him out of church for a very long time. That he's felt like there are a lot of hypocrites in the church. People who say one thing and do another. They don't act like Jesus. I had to be honest with him. If he hangs out with me for much longer, he's going to find that I'm a hypocrite, that he was right. I haven't arrived. Yesterday's holiness was good for yesterday, but today's a new day. I have to choose today to be more like Christ to rely on God's love, to be intertwined with God's presence, to be confident in God's grace that even though like the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, I feel like I am the worst sinner of all. He still loves me. He invites me today to live a holy life so that I can have life to the full. even though he calls imperfect people like you and me, when we begin to crave being more like Jesus, then people don't see the hypocrisy in the church anymore. They see Christ in us. And as they draw closer, pick up the scent of Christ in us. As they stand in our presence and observe how we handle good news and bad news, they begin to see the example of lives that have been transformed by Jesus Christ. For friends, that is holy living. And when you and I embrace holy living, we experience life to the full. This is living. I don't know about you, but I want to experience the fullness of life. It only comes through Jesus Christ. If you're here today and maybe, maybe you've tried, maybe you've tried to do things God's way, but you just feel like you can't measure up. I get that. I discovered a long time ago, I can't measure up. That's why I need Jesus. That's why I need to be closer to Him. To be holy means to be set apart for a special purpose. This week, Pastor Jack was reading from the Pigeon Bible. It's a transliteration for Native Hawaiians who have melded languages together and Instead of saying holy in this passage of Scripture, it would say you're special, 
special. You're special. Maybe you don't feel special. I want to tell you today, you're special to God. You're so special that he gave something worth far more than silver and gold for you. Maybe today you don't feel special because you've never accepted the free gift that he purchased for you with the blood of Jesus. You've never been purified by Jesus. Maybe today's the day when you say, I, I want to invite you to purify me for the first time so that I can begin to live a special life. This is Liz.